Crossroads Live. I'll tell you what, they keep bringing them, they get, keep be getting better looking all the time, you know what I'm saying? I've got Miss Lauren Lowe with me, and she is a writer. And where's home for you? Baltimore, Maryland. And you write these western stories about Texas, I love it. Yeah, well, you have to dig deep for the research. Yeah. And talk to a lot of Texans. Yeah, talk to a lot of Texans. Talk to a lot of Texans. And, uh, you have this beautiful book here with a beautiful cover, and I want to I want to show it to everybody. It's called Beautiful Bandit. Mm -hmm. Tell us about Beautiful Bandit. Well, the story starts out uh, a is a bank robbery. The hero of the story is trying to sell off a piece of his land so that he can recoup the losses from uh, a lot of cattle on his ranch that died of of a disease. So he's selling off a piece of his land, and while he's in the bank doing all this, this deal, the bank gets robbed. And as he looks out the window, he sees a woman who is actually a captive of the outlaws riding off with the bad guys. And she escapes them, and on his way home, because it takes days and days to ride a horse from where he was to where he needs to go in Eagle Pass, and she escaped and came into his camp, and he took her home. And the rest of the story is how they get. He knows she's lying about something, but he doesn't know what. She's using a fake name. Oh, so he thinks she's part of the gang until close to the end of the story when he's, when he, well, I won't tell the end of the story. No, don't tell that the end. That would be no, dumb. No, no, that's not that good. Be dumb. <laughs> what you have to do is, now, where can this book be bought? Online. Uh, you can get it at Amazon or Barnes & Noble or from the company. Oh. Uh, Whitaker House. Pretty okay. Sure. All right. Publishes these. So there you go. Want to read about a beautiful bandit? There you go. Right. <laughs> right. Okay. So, well, let me ask you something on a personal level. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, how long have you been writing? I started writing uh, professionally in the mid '80s, but I wrote nonfiction. I wrote articles exclusively, and then uh, I got an assignment from our local newspaper, and they wanted me to write a series of articles, eight articles about solid waste management and which would be the most effective for our county. So I went all over the place looking at, with the chief engineer of the county, see which was most affordable. We put the articles out and the editors changed the uh, facts because we didn't know it at the time, the engineer and I, but the commission had already bought the land for a landfill, even though incineration, we found from our studies, would be the most economical and environmentally friendly and stuff. So I came home and I had a fit. And my husband said, well, if you're going to write fiction for a living, why don't you write a novel? So I did. And I sold it, and it got Best Book of the Year, Reader's Choice. Right. right? Best Book Very of good. the Year. And Very then good. the bug had bit, and I got addicted to writing fiction, and I've been writing fiction. First book came out in 94, and I've been writing ever since. And you told me earlier that you were a teacher. I teach writing, and uh, I was, this is not my calling. I was. I went to school to become a teacher at high school level of home economics. All right. But during my student teaching year, I realized I didn't like teenagers very much. Oh. <laughs> so they were bigger than me yeah. and mouthy, and I didn't have control, and I was a little bit intimidated, so I just said, this is not working. So, and that was before I became a Christian and asked God what he thought I should be doing. And I ended up doing a lot of other part-time things. And I went on the road and became a singer for a while. Came off the road, met my husband. That was my calling. At least I thought it was my soul calling. Then we had kids and now I have grandkids. But this is what he called me to do. Because yeah. in every story, there's a little bit, of, little bit of God. Well, may I ask you about the music? Sure. Well, sure. What, what kind of music did you Country, say? mostly. Country music? Almost exclusively, yeah. yeah. So did you? ever make the Nashville scene? I did not. I would love to have made the Nashville scene. My first trip to Nashville just happened in April. And it was 
the most fun. I sat front row at the Ryman and watched Charlie Daniels sing. Oh, the Charlie Daniels, Georgia. man. I felt like a teenage I got to groupie. see him. I got to see him in concert once and thoroughly enjoyed it. Oh, it was fantastic. Yeah. The whole week there was fantastic. Yeah. We got to see some really good performers. So. All right. I would have liked it at the time, the funny thing, and I thought going to Nashville was going to be difficult because it was a dream when I was right. younger to get that, that status and be on the Grand Ole Opry or at the Ryman. And I, was, I realized, sitting right there in the front row, that even if I'd been on the stage, that isn't where God put me, that wanted me to be. This is yeah. what he wants. He likes me in the house, typing, yeah. you know, talking to myself, talking standing to up, acting out things, <laughs> scenes in the book. Uh, <laughs> I do that a lot. Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, so did you ever try any songwriting? Or just... I did, but they were awful. And so I know. At least you're so, honest. Yeah, they were awful. <laughs> they were teenage girl. Oh, he left me for another girl. You know, stupid. Well, wait a minute. Stuff. That sounded like what I hear on the radio. <laughs> yeah, but they weren't good. They were bad. They were just bad. All right, let's talk about Maverick Hart. This had nothing to do with Brett Maverick, does it? No, no. no. Okay. Now, Maverick Never. Hart is number two in this series. This is the Lone Star Legends series, and that's book two. Yeah. But you don't have to buy any of the books in order or this book or that book to understand. Yeah. They're all about the same cousins, but you wouldn't need one yeah. to, to yeah. do the other. Each story stands on its own. It does, yeah. absolutely. Right. And that story opens with a bank robbery. This story opens with a stagecoach robbery, and she loses her husband in the stagecoach robbery right. and ends up going into the same town, Eagle Pass, Texas, because that's where they're closest. Yeah. And instead of being a nurse, because there's no hospital in those days in Eagle Pass, she yeah. became the teacher. And of course she met the hero, one of the ranchers, same ranchers, same ranch as in book one. And the rest of the story, you buy the book. No, buy the book, yeah. buy the book, <laughs> buy the book. Okay, well, well wait a minute, let my boy go in the next one. Everybody has a love story. Tell us your love story. My love story. Well, I met my husband of almost 43 years now. I wait, was, a minute, wait a minute, is this thing gonna work out? I hope so. Oh, okay. I hope so. I've invested a lot in this book. <laughs> <laughs> Two kids, seven grandkids. I uh, hope it works out. Yeah. He, I was working at an insurance company, and one of my girlfriends ran the PBX switchboard. Now, see how old I am? PBX switchboard. Yeah. Who even out there knows what that is anymore? Anyway? No one. No one. <laughs> and so I'm running the switchboard, and my husband was in the, as a glazing superintendent. And they put in this new office, they put glass around my boss's office and the man that worked for my husband cut his hand and bled all over the brand new rug. So he had to come in and see how much damage was done. And he got off the elevator, and I'm sitting there doing somebody else's job where I didn't usually sit. And it was just love at first sight. He was just cute as could be in his little suit and stuff. Yeah. And we chit-chatted while he waited for my boss to see him so he could do, inspect the damage. And uh, on the way out, he stopped at the desk again. He said, do you, have, do you want to go to lunch? And I said, I've already eaten lunch. I had tuna. And he said, well, about tomorrow. I said, sure. But I didn't think he'd come back. You know how guys are. I don't <laughs> so, know. How are they? <laughs> so the next day, sure enough, he showed up. And I had another tuna sandwich in my desk that got really rancid by the end of the day. But we had lunch that day and never saw anybody else after. And nine months later, we got married. Wow. And a year later, we were celebrating our first anniversary when I went into labor with our first child. Oh, so, my goodness gracious. Yeah, that's my love story. Unbridled, a wonderful story, by the way. Oh, it's thank a great you. Great story. I love it when it works out. Oh, it does. Yeah. yeah. Unbridled Hope. Let's talk yep. about Unbridled Hope. Well, there that's we book three in the Lone Star Legends series. And this story starts with a steamboat explosion, which the heroine thinks she caused. She didn't, of course, but she thinks she does. And she has a scar. Her brother is the only other person on the boat besides her to, su to survive. And he goes deaf because of the big, loud noise. So she feels responsible for everything. You know how women are. <laughs> yeah. They take the blame. Oh, no, I know yeah. a little of them. I know. Yeah. So then she ends up in Eagle Pass mm -hmm. because it's the closest town to where she is. And she opens a dress shop to support her brother because he can't hear. And in those days, we didn't have hearing aids and operations and cochlear implants and all the things we have today. So in 1882, she, had, she felt responsible for him. And uh, so she bumps into the third hero, who's a cousin to the other two heroes, 
And there's the rest of the story. <laughs> okay, all on Amazon. All on Amazon. All on Amazon. Right. Now we got one more. We got one more. Yep. We got a show. And yep. oh, by the way, before we get into this one, how many books have you written all together? I have written about 210, but this is the, this one we're going to talk about next is the 101st to be published. Oh, to yes. be published. Right. All right. Um, this is Currency of the Heart. Am I saying that correctly? Yep. Currency yep. of the Heart. Mm -hmm. But they, they tease me because I'm from Louisiana. They think <laughs> I can't read. Uh, so tell us a little bit about this book. Well, this is book one in the Secrets on Sterling Street series from Whitaker House. All these books, by the way, are from Whitaker House. And Whitaker, the book's not even due out until January. This is how nice these people are. They knew I was coming here and I wanted to show off the book. And they made me this cover in three days' time. Wow. So inside there is somebody else's book just to beef it up a little bit. And, but it's a, it's a story of, uh, it's the gold rush time and the silver gold, you know, both of those eras. So it's, it's Denver, set in Denver this time in 1888, which is the year my grandfather was born. So I thought that was kind of a little tribute to him is to do the research and find out all the things I could about Denver. And it was a pretty wild and crazy place. I would not want to, I've been to Denver. I like Denver, but I, I loved Denver. wouldn't have wanted yeah. to live there then because it was wild and crazy and very scary and dangerous. So this gal, the, hero, the heroine of this book, is, is a widow. And she starts out very, um, what, a, what is the word to use? She's very into material things. And she's more interested in what people think of her, because when her husband was alive, they had a lot of money. They lived in a big house. And her big secret is that she's living in this house as a widow with nothing, because her husband gambled and she didn't know it till after he was dead. And so now she has all these bills to pay. So little by little, she's selling off furniture and selling all her pretty dresses and all of her jewelry that he bought her from Europe. And she's faking it, 100% faking it. And then her house burns down. So she doesn't have to fake it anymore. And the hero comes to her rescue and says, well, as a matter of fact, the lady who runs my house, of course, he's a big rancher in Denver, outside of Denver, and he says she needs help because she, she broke her leg. So she goes to work real hard, taking care of ranchers and ranch hands and, you know, beating rugs with a, with a yeah. rug beater and stuff, and her life is completely turned around and different. She realizes she likes this better than when she was a rich lady really? living in the mansion. So, and the story progresses so that she, um, she realizes the true value of things, and it's not things, it's the people that she's meeting. Yes, it's the people we meet. Right, yeah. and the hero, of course, it's is people the most meet. valuable person. Yeah. So, right. yeah. So that'll be the first in that series, and the other books will be set in the same area with some of uh, crossover characters, just like in the yeah. Lone Star Legends series. Yeah. And, um, so your characters live on from one book to another? They do, but like I said, you don't have to buy all three. I've always felt guilty about writing a book and forcing readers to buy three books. If they can afford one, I'm happy they buy one. Right. If they want to buy all three, I'm happy about that too. Yeah. But I'm more concerned if they get one that they'll enjoy. And all of these, well, this one hasn't been out yet, but these have all won awards and got really good reviews. And that one is option for a TV movie. Oh, so wonderful. we'll see what happens. If they come yeah. up with the money, <laughs> that's always the thing. I've got the yeah, buyer right. buy right. option. Yeah. And you know how it is. It's all about the money. It's all about the money. Oh, it's all yep. about the money. I'll tell you what. I want to thank you for taking this time to come be with us on Crossroads and tell us about your lovely books and about your life. Well, and, thank you so much for having me. It's well, been a pleasure. My pleasure and our pleasure. And so thank you very much. Thank and, you. Uh, lots of luck with the books. Thank you. We'll be waiting for the movie. And you get all this stuff on Amazon and... A Barnes & Noble or from Whitaker House. At the, the website is www.whitakerhouse.com. All right, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. That was cool. Oh, sorry. We have the Caring for a Person with Alzheimer's Disease book. It is from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, the National Institute on Aging. Guess what? Guess what? This book is free. It's about 100 pages because now we know that there are millions of Americans out there that are taking care of someone with some form of autism, some form of, of Alzheimer's. 
This is strictly an Alzheimer's disease book. And basically it says, your easy to guide, easy to use guide from the National Institute on Aging. We're gonna put up the address, we're doing commercials, we're very passionate about this cause because we want Alzheimer's patients taken care of. All right, and welcome back to Crossroads Live. My name is Jim Hoffpower, and I'm sitting here with Elaine Smith. Correct. Right, right. She's got a book of poetry. Poetry, am I saying that right? Poetry. And called Cowboy Rhymes and Dreams of Other Times. I like that. Thank you. And, uh, but I find what's interesting is this is a book made up of different poets mm -hmm. that you have. And why don't you tell me the story about all the different people who have poems in this book? Okay, well the first thing is I got interested in cowboy poetry because I was asked as a writer, I was asked to judge a cowboy poetry contest at an event in Dublin, Texas. And so we read a bunch of poems that people had, had submitted and we had finalists, and I met two of these guys through that competition, actually, plus this girl. So I have a couple of people from Texas that I know are cowboy poets, one from Utah who is pretty, pretty well known in, up in that part of the world as a cowboy poet, myself, and then my friend in Utah hooked me up with an up-and-coming cowboy poet who is 10 years old and he's making a splash up there in his northern world yeah. we're pretty proud of him and I'm proud to have been able to to uh, include him in this in this book and his parents and I've co corresponded quite a bit mm -hmm. so we're all good on that and our girl is a graduate student at Tarleton State University very good very good but how about you know what you didn't do is tell us their names. What okay. Is, all right, talk about We have the, the, the 10 year old is Thatch Elmer. He goes by Cowboy Thatch, the Bear River Buckaroo mm. in Wyoming. And the uh, Tyler Guy is an accomplished cowboy poet in Utah. Bill Hickman is a published poet who lives in the DFW area. Lloyd Huggins is a rancher in Central Texas and a longtime friend of mine. His wife was my roommate in college mm. and our good friends. Laura Proctor is a graduate student at Tarleton State University. In fact, she might have graduated with her master's degree last night. Oh, I'm not positive well, that's of that. wonderful. Yeah. And then there's me. There's you. There's me. I'm a native Texan and a published author. I have two books out working on another. And so when you went to college, what was your degree in? Horticulture. You know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't lead a horticulture. Really? That's what they say. I didn't know that. Yeah. I mean, you know, I know about the horse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it was horticulture, plants yeah. and uh, agronomy, which is plant and soil science. And then I promptly got a job at an insurance company and that was just lost. But my love was always writing. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In fact, in college, I took a, a, uh, an elective, Romanticism and Realism in American Literature, as an elective. Mm -hmm. So I kind of leaned that direction. Yeah. So uh, all your work now is in this? Where can people get this? Where this is uh, available on my website right now at uh, blazingstarbooks.com, and it's only $10. Wow. How about that? So there you go. Yep. You want to you wanna do a poem? I do. I, the very first poem that I tried to do, they say you have to write from your own experience. So gr growing up in Dallas, I didn't have like, you know, cowboy out on the riding range and wearing a cowboy hat and stuff. I, I didn't have that. But we did have some acreage and some friends of ours brought their horses over. So this is kind of that story. Okay. okay? I call this a backyard wild ride. 
So when I was just a little girl, all I wanted out of the whole wide world was a fine spotted pony to ride fast on a beach. But such dreams as this were way out of my reach. Then the same summer I turned aged 11, you'd have thunk I'd up and gone straight to heaven. When our family friends known as the Baker twins brought their horses to graze at our place. There was my dream in my own backyard, a black and white paint. I had to play it smart. Over the next few weeks, I carefully planned while Apache took grass through the fence from my hand. He wore a rope halter, which didn't really go with the wildness and spirit that big horse could show. A car door slammed, sick feelings hit my gut. The twins had arrived with fresh hay. You want to ride him? Twin one asked. I nodded my head, trying to hide excitement, happiness, and dread. Twin two clipped a rope on the halter as reins, and one boosted me upward to grab a handful of mane. Just ride for a bit while we unload the hay. I nodded again and turned Apache away. Hooves clippity-clopped. I vainly tried to stop. Happy tears as we walked down the drive. On his bare back, I sat tall and with grace. Apache felt good too, he picked up the pace. I sounded like cowboys on TV. The big horse responded and ran straight for a tree. Horse apples weighed heavy on the low hanging branches. I dropped the rope and ducked low, not taking any chances. Woo, in the clear, but mom's clothesline was near. Long wires stretched between rusty poles. Then Apache must have caught a whiff of fresh hay because he turned and galloped before I could say, Whoa, please stop. We're going to hit the wire. I gripped his mane tightly. The situation was dire. Slipping off to one side, I started to pray, but saw the, t the twins were finished up with the hay. Those two coal black ears, they just barely cleared as we passed under the clothesline wires. Well, Apache finally woed after we got to the fence. I pulled myself upward. The relief was immense. The Baker twins came running, but before long we was funning and laughed so hard we cried about how my nice dream to roam stayed right here at home and became an exciting backyard wild ride. All right, I love it. I love it. Thank you. All right. I tell you what, I want to thank you for taking this time to come share your book with us. Thank and you. Everything. I appreciate and it. Once again, tell everybody where we can they can pick right. this book up at. This is on my website, www.blazingstarbooks.com. Thanks for watching. We'll be right back on Crossroads Live. We have the Caring for a Person with Alzheimer's Disease book. It is from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, the National Institute on Aging. Guess what? Guess what? This book is free. It's about 100 pages because now we know that there are millions of Americans out there that are taking care of someone with some form of autism, some form of, of Alzheimer's. This is strictly an Alzheimer's disease book. And basically it says, your easy to guide, easy to use guide from the National Institute on Aging. We're gonna put up the address, we're doing commercials, we're very passionate about this cause because we want Alzheimer's patients taken care of. Welcome to Crossroads Live. I'm sitting here with a young lady named Rita Deer. How are you, Rita Deer? I'm doing fine, thank you. How are you? All right. Tell me, tell me, uh, how did you get started being a writer? I took an early retirement to take care of my mother, and I was sitting up nights looking for something to do, and I started writing stories. All right. And tell me about, uh, what type of stories do you write? I write mystery fiction. I have a 12-book uh, series. Uh -huh. It's about an INS agent who has to go undercover in a small town in New Mexico, and I made up the town. He has to go undercover as a Baptist preacher to investigate allegations of a sex slavery ring in the oh, area. Oh my goodness gracious. 
And it has expanded to a 12 book series, and I'm working on 13. 13, I'm right. On 13. 13. So, and you said, how long have you been writing? Uh, probably the last five years. Five as years, as right? Five years. And is this the only story that you've written on a long list? No, line? I have. Um, I've gone back and taken the main character into seventh grade in a prequel series for teenagers. Yeah. And I have a standalone book about a girl in a wheelchair in high school. Right. So I've actually got 14 in print right now. So what kind of work did you do before you became a writer? <laughs> I was an auditor. An auditor. <laughs> an auditor. Not, I had, for the I, IRS? Or? No, no, no. But I had a lot of years of technical writing. Technical so writing. fiction writing is more fun. It's free. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, so you can. So like somebody I interviewed once, who's a fiction writer, said, "We can lie." <laughs> <laughs> That's probably true, but not yeah. to an auditor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Never to an auditor. Yeah. So what's the inspiration behind your book? I, I wanted to prove that you could go back to the old writing standards, close bedroom doors, limit the foul words, and still have a story on a serious subject. Yeah. Without going extremely graphic and all the rest of it. Yeah. And that was the challenge because I grew up reading books like that, and I didn't really need all that gory detail that so many people decide so, to write. So, like some of the TV we watch today, right? Very true. Very yeah, true. Yeah, and very uh, true. I want to go back to the I Love Lucy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Gone with the Wind. Uh, yeah, yeah, there I know you what go. At the yeah. top of the stairs. Well, yeah. But, you know, go, Gone with the Wind set a standard, too. You it know. certainly so, did. And look what it's gone from there. That's true. That's yeah. very true. So, have you got a new book now that you're working on? I'm working on the second one in the teen prequel series, and I'm working on the 13th in the original series. Oh, okay. So okay. I have two in progress right now. Okay, very good. And these books can be gotten where? You can get them just from readadeer.com. You can look me up on, on uh, yeah. email. They're also on Amazon. Amazon. And they're under the title name is Utopian Destiny is the name of the series. All right. Because I named the town Utopian Springs, and when the book, when the story expanded to a series, it right. became Utopian yeah. Destiny. Yeah. Okay. So, and that's spelled with an EU, which is EU. unusual. Okay. Very good. Well, listen, reader. I want to thank you for taking this time well, to thank come, you. come spend with us and tell us about your story. I appreciate and, it. Thank you so much. And uh, we will. Uh, We'll be looking for your books. And I hope look, so. And we'll be looking for, uh, they'll, they'll be making a TV show out of this, right? I hope so. Ah, there you go. Thank you so much, <laughs> Rita. We sir. appreciate really it very appreciate much. It. All right. We'll see you later on the crossroads. So, till we meet again, good luck, God bless, and we'll see you at the crossroads. Let's go, Dean.